Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. So just to, just so you know that you can email us at any time. We get your emails, we read your emails, and we've gotten some emails requesting some return guests. Uh, so I've been trying to book them all up, and one of those return guests is I think someone who's been on the show three or four times, uh, but it's been a way too long. Coming back to the show is Dr. M. David Litwa. Hi, Dr. Litwa. Hi, nice to be back. Yeah, it's been too long. Yeah. So uh, in the meantime, you've released a lot of books, but uh, we're going to be talking about your, your book, Found Christianities. Um, and uh, uh, before we do that, actually, we're going to be doing some, uh, you know what, we'll do the plug for your Patreon right away, because those watching at home who aren't listening to us as a podcast, you know, we can throw things up in the screen. Technology, it's amazing. So patreon.com slash mdavidlitwa. And you were saying you do almost daily posts there? Well, probably not daily posts, but for those who want to join at a certain tier, I'm daily on there answering questions and messages and comments on the posts. Uh, I do try to put on a post every 48 or 36 hours, which is usually a video. So essentially, there's like full courses online you can take from me. And uh, uh, one of those courses is on the Found Christianity's book. So if you get the book, uh, you can take the course along with the book. Yeah. And, you know, while, while we're opening up with plugs, you know, Found Christianities, you know, some of your books are, are academic books. They're very expensive. You know, they're meant for uh, academic libraries. But Found Christianities, it's, it, is it written for a, a wider audience? Is it more affordable? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the widest possible audience anyone with an interest in christianity can pick up and and enjoy this book and thankfully in the paperback uh you're looking at i think about 35 us dollars i actually don't check that very often but um yeah uh, and on the on the kindle you're looking at uh something even more reasonable um but if you just you know you can also hop on patreon and get a sense for the book by going through some of the videos and if you're interested you can pick up the book later. So yeah, uh, it is affordable and uh, hopefully useful to many of you. Yeah, well, uh, we'll just dive right into it. So, and, and you know, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but there, there's sort of a, a popular idea that in the first few Christian centuries, there's just a group of, of Christians who are the proto-Orthodox or the proto-Catholic Christians. And they become the dominant form of Christianity that won out. They survived. And then there's a whole bunch of other groups. They don't really matter much. There's some heresies. And, and to be honest, you know, these other groups, you know, maybe they're not even really Christian. Uh, maybe they use some Christian mythology and figures. Uh, but, you know, they're Gnostics or they're other kinds of heresies. They're taking in all these ideas from the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians. They don't matter. They all died out and they're, and, and they're gone. Is there, is, is there problems with this, this idea of formulations like, like this? And I know I didn't say it in the most sophisticated way, but I hope you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> no, that's a very common narrative. And one of the reasons why it's common is because it's actually a heresiological narrative. That is, it's a narrative generated by Christian apologists in ancient times, not just in modern times. And it, it's pretty much the argument of uh, my friend, uh, the author of the Refutation of All Heresies, um, whom I don't call Hippolytus, uh, but uh, that's what he said. They said that his group was the Christian group and that other groups were the Gnostic groups. And that by Gnostic, uh, he essentially uh, meant um, heretic. And this uh, apologetic discourse has been continued so that even in modern times, uh, uh, very recently, you have the conflict model in which you know Christianity is like in a battle, uh, like between uh, Typhon and Set, you know, um, or, or sorry, Set and uh, uh, Horus battling for supremacy in the second century, and that uh, that model uh, one has to be very careful with because uh, one of the my favorite quotes, which I like to uh, quote uh, from the Nasin preacher. Uh, is that he says, uh, and to quote his Greek, hey, mes mani Christiani, we are the only Christians. And so not only are groups who are 
sort of shelved away as Gnostic, not only are they claiming to be Christian, in some cases they're claiming to be the only Christians. And that's really extraordinary. And uh, f even for groups that are commonly written off as unchristian, like the Simonians, uh, these groups all have Christian uh, ideas, such as Trinitarian ideas and uh, a view and theory of Jesus. And uh, they are advancing uh, what they consider to be a gospel message. And the only people who pay attention to them and are threatened by them are other Christians. Yeah. So instead of the conflict model, what I'm proposing in this book is more of a sort of a, uh, a an interactionist model where, yes, there is competition, but there's also, as is often the case, a lot of unconscious borrowing and uh, some of it conscious, some of it's conscious interaction and learning. And all these groups are together uh, forming, just like Christian groups today, their Christian identities in interaction with each other, learning from each other and building on each other. And yes, claiming to be the best representation of the Jesus movement. Yeah. And to, to clarify this model, uh, the, the conflict model, it, it's not just espoused by those with a theological bent, like there are historians who, who also adopt it, or we can find it in other places that uh, aren't just Christian apologetics? Absolutely. Uh, Bart Ehrman, who is uh, uh, the last I checked, an agnostic, maybe a full atheist at this point, you basically uses this model in his book, Lost Christianities. So my title, Found Christianities, is actually an answer to him. It's not that I disagree with everything in the, in the conflict model, but the truth is Christianity isn't a horse race. You know, it's, it's not like you're, you're watching different groups who are, who are running a race and then, you know, only one, one group wins. Um, it's much more, if you can think of it in terms of modern sociology, and even if you were to look at modern groups, Christian groups today, you know, where you have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and, uh, all versions of Catholic and Melkite and Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. Now we have Ukrainian Orthodox for good reason. There's a whole lot of groups out there claiming to be the, the true Christians. And none of them, I mean, they all have a case, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not like we primarily look at these modern groups as in like a, you know, a a conflict unto death. Uh, no, I mean, they, they themselves are, are often more ironic in their uh, own approach to, to other groups. Um, and they basically, they aren't out to destroy one another. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe some, maybe evangelical fundamentalists might be out to destroy or to assume or absorb other Christian groups. But the fact is, the way the pluralistic society that we live in is actually in some ways fairly similar to the to the religious pluralism that was available in the uh, second century of the Roman Empire. Admittedly, the governmental situation was much more like a, a dictatorship, but in terms of the religious scene, you had incredible religious diversity on the ground and no one was funded, you know, or, or uh, that is no Christian group was funded or supported by the state until the fourth century. So yeah, th this is, you need to think, yeah, very complex uh, in, a, in a complex fashion about these, these Christian groups. Um, it's often said that, you know, there's one great church that, that was, was in the majority. And that's just not, that's just not true. Actually, this term great, great church uh, comes from Celsus, who was himself uh, not a Christian, but was a critic of Christianity. And it's interesting that, you know, there's, he, he mentions the great church, but he doesn't say who that church is. And it's actually not clear that he's talking in terms of population demographics, right? Uh, and, and we don't have any population demographics. And it's funny, when you turn over to Nagamadi, and you open a text such as the, the Second Discourse or Second Treatise of Great Seth, the Second Treatise of Great Seth, who is, you know, a quote-unquote Gnostic or, or 
I think it's fair to call him a Sethian author, um, he says that his opponents are, and I quote, few and uneducated, unquote. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, and, and his opponents are the early Catholics. So, you know, who, so who is right? And, and this is a very important question because it, it's so important not to replicate the discourse of uh, you know, your, your tradition, like, uh, you know, you know, well, we're the great church or, or we're the first church, um, that kind of, that kind of insider religious discourse is actually quite common. And you'll have various groups claiming to be the most numerous or the first or the most original. And the point of doing good history is to say, is to take a step back and to say, well, let's not treat these as you know discrete entities like horses in a race and let's let's treat them as more fluid entities which they were and where their identities aren't like set in stone and they're learning from each other and in interaction with each other and actually worshiping with each other if you read the book of jude you know he's all worried about you know uh there's people in your love feasts uh and, and uh, who you should be worried about. But what I find interesting about that is, well, they're in the love feasts, you know, so, so they're, and that's a Christian ritual. So they're, the, the enemies are inside the church, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean they're, they're worshiping together. So it, it's not like, you know, two separate entities, like trying to destroy each other. No, they're actually worshiping together in the same uh, locale. Which reminds me, and uh, I'll shut up soon, but you also have to take a look at different localities. So whereas you might be able to make an argument that the early Catholics achieved dominance in late second century Rome, you wouldn't be able to say that in a place like Alexandria or Antioch or Edessa. You know, Walter Bauer, uh, whose book on, on orthodoxy and heresy, I mean, one of his strongest arguments was actually about Edessa, that, you know, up until like third and fourth century, the people who were called Christians in Edessa, which is today very Eastern Syria, were Marcionites. And the, the uh, Catholics were called Paludians. So, <laughs> and, and we have warnings in the fourth century Jerusalem that, you know, when you visit Jerusalem, you should always ask for the for the Catholic Church, because if you ask for the Christian Church, they will lead you to the Marcionite building. Yeah, and and in your book, you actually do kind of organize uh, the, these different groups that you talk about by geographic area, right? So, uh, yep, yeah, yeah. absolutely, Excellent. yeah. So, I mean, I, I cover actually. So, there's there's 26 chapters. Um, the first one is is just kind of setting the scene, but. Yeah, so it's a combination of looking at different figures. So in, in section one, um, Cerinthus, Simon, and the Nicolaitans um, are, are all kind of Eastern figures. And then part two looks at early Syrian teachers. Part three looks at early Egyptian theologians. And then I turn to Rome in part four, Asia Minor in part five, um, late second century Rome in part six, and then the later Alexandrian theologians in part seven. So I do try to keep that very precise geographical uh, focus in mind. And I think that's really important in general. Yeah, so, so I think we've really done a, a good job of sort of setting the scene, but is, is there anything else that, that we should know or, or, or that we should talk about when it comes to the first century? Because I know you open your book with sort of laying the groundwork, you know, letting people know uh, about the sort of socioeconomic, political, and, and of course, I know we're talking about wide areas and a wide range of time, but can you tell us a little bit more uh, about the first century to, to give us some context about the groups we're gonna talk about next? Well, yes. So the time frame that I'm looking at uh, will begin in the late first century, more or less the reign of Nerva, which is uh, very late uh, first century. But then primarily the book is on uh, the second century. And um, in the introduction, I go through my method and I introduce you to all the uh, heresiologists. And I talk about 
you know, why we should consider these groups to be um, diverse Christians and why we don't really need a lot of other labels for them, such as Gnostic, why we shouldn't use labels like Orthodox, or sorry, or, well, Orthodox and or unorthodox, or and certainly not uh, heretic, which is just, you know, playing a religious insider game. It's not really useful at all. Um, the way that these people identify themselves as Christians. So the goal of the book is to more or less absorb these people back into the mainstream discourse of early Christian history. Because sometimes, I mean, you'll see siphoned off still today, you know, like those who study, you know, patristics, which is the, the church fathers and, you know, sometimes the church mothers, but um, they don't know anything about alternative Christian movements. And actually, uh, this year at the North American Patristic Society, as in the past three years, I'm helping to run a session on alternative Christianities, uh, which includes the broader field of these other people who claim to be Christians. And uh, some of their traditions uh, still survive today. But in setting the scene, you know, I go through the uh, go through the Roman emperors. I go through the dominant philosophical movements, uh, literature, medicine, astronomy, and also imperial cults. Uh, the second century was a real, uh, you know, fantastic time for translocal cults, uh, and uh, was the height of the so-called mystery cults. And so Christianity is growing at a time when there's a there's a lot of religious competition from a variety of fields, and uh, that's why you know figures like Celsus, who's preserved in Origen's work against Celsus, is so fun to read because he notices that there's so much, not only parallels between Christianity and other mystery cults, other translocal cults like Isis and Mithras, but he also notices that there's a lot of intra-Christian diversity. So Celsus is aware of, you know, Marcionites and Simonians and people he calls Hellenians and Marcellinians. <laughs> and he knows all these different groups, some of which, you know, we, even we are unfamiliar with. Um, so uh, yeah, that's just a launching point then to talk about uh, all these different figures in depth. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't have time to go through through all of the figures and uh, all the different groups that you talk about in your book. But you know, I, I selected a few that that I find fascinating, and I know our audience will find fascinating. But but can we start with Serinthus? And you know, who was he? What are the teachings associated with him? What does he have to do with the Gospel of John? Does any of this have to do with the Father of the Devil? Yeah. So I've got both uh, a chapter on Serinthus. Um, I started with Serinthus because I didn't want to start with Simon. <laughs> but I, I mean, because the heresiologists start with Simon and I, I wanted to tell a different kind of a, of a story. Uh, so I, I started with Serinthus and uh, he's a fascinating figure from Asia Minor. And he's He's definitely Christian, uh, but usually he's categorized into two different groups, which seem to conflict. Uh, in 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 one category, he's a Jewish Christian, and in another category, he's a so-called Gnostic. And what I try to show is that we don't really need any of those categories, which are a little bit anachronistic for his time. You know, Serenthus is super super early. I mean, he's he's late first century, early second century Christian teacher in Asia Minor, and he's a, basically a, a, a reader of the Gospel of, of Mark and, and John, and uh, in, in which case he basically reads the baptism as his theory of incarnation is that uh, the divine spirit of Christ inhabited Jesus uh, through the, the dove, or as is, as is depicted by the dove entering him, which is the language of Mark. And that at the end of his uh, earthly life uh, on the cross, he breathes out that divine spirit. So there's both an incarnation and a sort of a deincarnation, or a decarnation, I guess. And uh, that's very echoed very much in John 19, where Jesus, you know, breathes out that that spirit uh, on the cross. So interestingly later however in the late second century Gaius of, of Rome uh, apparently made the accusation that Serenthus wrote the Gospel of John 
And uh, it was even claimed a bit later uh, that he also wrote the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse of John. And these are really interesting claims and, and really interesting that they're made in the late uh, second century probably. And they indicate that to me at least, uh, and April DeConnick has also talked about this, but that Serenthus is a reader of John and that his theology is a biblical theology. And he's the, so he's really like the first known attested biblical theologian who's just reading texts like Mark and John and comes up with a theory of incarnation, a theory that just happens not to agree with what later became orthodoxy in the fourth century, which is mostly constructed out of the uh, later gospel of Luke. And, or, you know, in the second and third century, there's more and more insistence on the theories of incarnation where Jesus somehow uh, is, uh, the flesh of Jesus is divinized within the womb of Mary. I mean, Serenthus just probably didn't even know Luke, which is the interesting thing. So it, there's no way he could come up with that theory himself. But based on the text that he was reading, his theory of incarnation made a lot of sense to him and had a huge uh, after effect uh, in the history of Christian theology. So there's still, you know, groups uh, who, uh, yeah, definitely think that something happened at the baptism, something like a, a possession. Um, and since that, that Christology has since come known to be a possessionist Christology. And it's, that's very different than what was called the Docetic Christian Christology, because in a possessionist Christology, you know, the word truly does become flesh. It's just located at the baptism. And the, the word, you know, continues to inhabit the flesh of Jesus throughout his entire ministry. You know, it's not a temporary kind of a thing. And then because the divine can't suffer, uh, it, it moves out or it can't die. It moves out of Jesus's body before the actual death. And this made sense to, you know, hundreds of, of, of Christians, thousands of Christians. And, and to a certain degree, it really just does make uh, a lot of good sense uh, today um, and is is represented in, uh, yeah, in, in, in theologies to a certain degree still today. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to get that reading from Mark. You know, I'm not going to go out and say that that is the original intent of Mark, we'll never know, but I, I can, I think it probably was, but it's, I can see how it's very easy to read that book, get that, uh, a Christology like that at least. Um, so, uh, so you mentioned Simon, uh, we, shamefully now we've been doing the show for almost 10 years. Uh, we haven't done a show on Simon. Hopefully you'll come back on sometime and do one with us, but let's, let's talk about him for, for a little bit, him and Helen and I put in the notes some exclamation marks and question uh, question marks because Simon was was a Christian. Absolutely. Well, that's exactly what the what the author of Acts says, and the author of Acts is a hostile source. So, if you're using the criterion of embarrassment, um, which says that you know when you have an apologetic source and they say something which proved to be an embarrassment to later Christians that was probably likely to be historically true. So the author of Acts portrays Simon as a baptized Christian. And there's absolutely no reason to my mind to dispute that because that fact was extremely embarrassing to Irenaeus. So that by the time you get to Irenaeus, he is so embarrassed by that. He trips over backwards in order to deny that Simon was a Christian, even though you know, his his number one sort of apologetic evidence for Simon is the book of Acts. But he's so embarrassed by the fact that Simon is, is actually a baptized Christian. And even though he gets into this spat with Peter, who seems to be quite unfair, you know, <laughs> I mean, Simon just wants authority to be able to transmit the spirit. And he as a young Christian might, uh, makes the mistake of, you know, offering payment to his teacher, Peter, and Peter blows up and says, to hell with you and your money. Um, 
And then, of course, you 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 have this case where, interestingly, Simon doesn't renounce Christianity. It's not like, well, you yelled at me. I'm going to deny and destroy the faith now. <laughs> no, he just, he actually starts crying. And he says, Peter, you know, pray for me. Uh, <laughs> and then the and then the story ends. So there's nothing to deny th that Simon uh, was a Christian, um, and everyone who pays attention to Simon, everyone who is threatened by Simon, starting with Justin Martyr, is a Christian. And so it, it's and it's clear that by the time of Irenaeus, uh, you've got a Simonian uh, Trinitarian theology, and you've got Simonians saying that. <laughs> Jesus, or sorry, Simon is Jesus. Um, Simon had three manifestations. His first manifestation in Samaria, he appeared as the father. In Judea, he appeared in a lower manifestation as the son. And now among the nations, he appears as the Holy Spirit. So there you go. You have a very in early Trinitarian theology, which we would call modalist today. In other words, there's one divine essence, and three divine manifestations, and that in all of those, Simon was the true referent. Now, interestingly, in our earliest Simonian sources, and I love Simon, and I've, I've, I've written recently an article that's in review now on the Great Declaration, and the earliest known Simonian source is the Great Declaration, which is only found in the Refutation of, Her of All Heresies, Book 6. If you join the Patreon, i provide my translation online um, and with my notes um, and also got episodes on Simon. Hopefully someday I'll be able to write a book on Simon. But those two early Simonian sources, uh, the Great Declaration and in Nagamati, the concept of our great power, are probably our earliest Simonian sources and our best chance at reconstructing something of what Simonians thought in the early second century, which ends up being quite different than what Irenaeus uh, reported in the late second century. Remember, Irenaeus is writing probably in the early 180s. So he's actually quite late in dealing with Simonians of his time who have sort of changed gears. And, uh, but I don't think in Irenaeus's mind there was any dispute that Simons were claiming to be Christians. Uh, otherwise, why attack them? You know, <laughs> I mean, if, if they're not claiming to be Christians, then why bother? And Origen explicitly says uh, that you know the only people who deal uh, with with Simonians are Christians. And uh, Eusebius in the fourth century says that. Simonians are still around baptizing and practicing Christian rituals. There's absolutely no dispute in my mind that historically Simonians are Christians and that Hel Helen was an important figure uh, such that Celsus reports in the 170s that there was a group, perhaps in Alexandria, perhaps in Rome, that was called the Hellenians. So, you know, recently Helen has been called, you know, the Eliza Doolittle of, of, of you know the, the heresy the heresiologist because she she just seems to be utterly dependent upon Simon and is and is portrayed as a deluded uh, prostitute basically uh, which is that you know sends a shiver down your spine for like the 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 kind of hatred involved in heresiological rhetoric but in fact she's important enough not only to be a teacher but for some Simonians just simply to say. I'm actually Hellenian. Um, now, I mean, the fact that they called themselves Simonians or Hellenians, it really isn't, that doesn't mean that they're not Christians. I mean, you wouldn't say that a Methodist or a Presbyterian wasn't a Christian today. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just really important to, to understand that, that point historically. And I know other scholars will disagree with me, but I think that that case uh, can be made and made well. Simonians are Christians. Yeah. Well, when you're, uh, uh, we'll get in touch with you when your article comes out because we'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, as I said, we we really need to do a deep dive on on Simon and some of your research on him. But but moving on, uh, and and I don't know if I, you know, I, I read so many 
so many words. And then, you know, I talk to other people interested in Gnosticism who only know them from reading. So we just give our bad pronunciations back and forth. But is it the practice? Uh, is that yeah, how you say it? I mean, I mean, formally, uh, the way this works in Greek is they're the parati. Um, yeah. But the adjective is paratic. So some scholars think that it's easier to pronounce paratics, is it like they pluralize the adjective, which is fine. Um, but yeah, whether you call them parati or paratic, uh, they are a very fascinating, uh, yeah, late second century, early Christian group. Yeah, anyway, uh, I'll let you go on. Oh yeah, well, I was just going to, to give some teasers, if you could tell us a little bit about them and their mythology, because I understand that uh, Jesus is a cosmic sky dragon, or maybe he's part of the human brain. So, so could you tell us a little bit about the their interpretation of Christianity? Well, this is one of the more, um, I think, innovative um, takes that I have. Um, so I think that paradics, to use that term, um, are have a share of fluid identity with a group that later became known as Alphites. Okay. And one of the chief characteristics of this particular Christian group is that they took John 3 very seriously, where Jesus portrayed himself as the bronze snake, which Moses up held in the wilderness so that the children of Israel could be healed or saved. It's the same word in Greek. And that story they took very seriously. So the snake symbology, which is usually coded as negative in Christian mythology, mostly based on, say, the book of Revelation chapter 12, where you have, you know, that great dragon, namely Satan. Um, that wasn't the universal reading of snake symbology. Um, the snake in, in Greek culture, or Draco, is a, uh, a sign of wisdom. And in fact, Jesus himself said that, you know, be as, as wise as snakes and as innocent as doves. Um, and so he's well aware of that overall cultural symbology. And so when Ophites and, and Paratics uh, go back to Genesis, uh, they have a very distinctive reading of the eating from the tree of Gnosis and actually positively uh, understand the eating from the tree of Gnosis. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. I mean, after all, it, you're gaining Gnosis. What, what's so negative about that? Um, <laughs> and the, the problem is with the creator who is trying to forbid you from getting that Gnosis. And that's the key sign that the creator isn't actually God because God is good and wants to share not only Gnosis, but his own divinity. So now that's not to say that in all paradic uh, theology or even in all Ophite theology, which is the broader category, that uh, the snake is necessarily positive, but certainly the, the snake's advice is positive. So sometimes you'll find like in the nature of the rulers uh, or hypostasis of the archons in Nagamati that, you know, the snake isn't positive, but the, the female divine principle inhabits the snake and then the snake becomes positive as the instructor. And uh, one of the things that, again, the paradics are only testified in the refutation of all heresies, which again shows you just how important this particular uh, text is. And the refutation, the refutator, I'll just call him, includes long excerpts from paratic uh, documents. And he shows that they took uh, Greco-Roman astronomy very seriously and that they, uh, when they looked upon the stars, they saw the stars as signs and symbols, one might say sacraments of the divine. And they uh, they saw uh, Christ in, in the stars um, and that they had a narrative about, you know, how the constellations were interacting. And uh, they believed that, you know, Christ was represented as a as the the office the the snake or uh, Draco as it's as it's called by its Latin name uh, was in the sky and that 
uh, in the Great Bear constellations, Ursus Maior and Ursus uh, Minor, uh, that you had the, the they had located the gateway out of this cosmos. And they were very scientifically oriented. So they, they allegorized not only the star maps, but they allegorized the human brain. And what they knew of the human brain is quite extraordinary, uh, which indicates that they are, they're readers of, of, of medical texts, uh, probably in the Alexandrian tradition, because that's uh, the only medical sort of sphere where they actually did human dissection. Uh, famously in the third century uh, BC. But they knew a lot about the parts of the brain and they, they believed that, uh, you, know, you know, someone had cut open a human head and sort of unraveled the brain and, and made a, a metaphor that, you know, the cerebellum kind of looks like a folded a snake and you can actually <laughs> you can kind of like I mean it's a bit of a gross image but you can actually like unwrap the brain and it kind of looks like you know a bit like an intestine um, and it, it like it's snake like and it's it, it reminded uh, them of a sort of a, a coiled um, snake and uh, but what's interesting with the pratics is they yeah they they actually map to the portions of the brain just as we do today now, of course, they're, you know, they're not as, as advanced as, as we are. They didn't have microscopes, but they knew that the brain had different parts and they mapped the different parts and sort of allegorized it. So like we think of traditional allegory as, you know, oh, well, we take up a Jewish text and you, you know, you allegorize the six days of creation. Well, the products were ready to allegorize basically everything and see uh, all of reality as a sign and sacrament of Christian truth. So they were looking in the stars, they were looking in, in, in the brain and, and several other areas to uh, show that God had left signs of his uh, divine revelation inside the human body. And uh, that was, it's, it's a fairly extraordinarily uh, intellectual move. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, okay, so moving on, you know, I'd love to say of them, but you know, barreling on. So, so I understand that uh, both in the book and do I have an upcoming monograph about uh, Carpocrates? Is that how you say his name? Um, uh, yeah, I see Carpocrates, but yeah, yeah, any way you can manage it, it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, so so Carpo Carpocrates, uh, Epiphanius, uh, I hope it's uh, Marcellia, and and I've seen takes on on these movements uh, that are pretty uh, pretty opposed, pretty extremely different from each other. Uh, from perhaps they were orgy loving hedonists, all the way over to that they were dedicated Christian Platonists who were trying to build the perfect society that's laid out in Plato's famous text of Republic. They were trying to build the Republic on Earth. Uh, what has your research led you to say about these three teachers and, and their interconnected movements? Well, suffice it to say that Carpocratians, among whom is included Carpocrates' most famous disciple, Marcelina, who is the only sole Christian female teacher uh, that we know of in late second century Rome, uh, is incredibly important for Christian history. And that the sad thing about Carpocrates when, is that scholars, some scholars continue to follow the heresiologists because of all the early Christian groups, Carpocratians are the ones most pilloried as being sexed, crazed, hedonistic maniacs and <laughs> it's only it, it's you know i mean they're only rivaled by epiphanius's description of the stratiotics and the fibionites uh who supposedly eat their own semen and menses uh i mean it's pretty it, it's awful stuff that is said about them awful stuff and What's interesting, I mean, there's, there's so much to say here, but what I'm offering, and it's coming out next month, is the first really full-length monograph on Carpocratians 
that has been published at any time. I mean, in 1930, in the 1930s, there was like a 55 page book or pamphlet on, on Carpocrates, but it basically just repeated what the heresiologist said. But uh, uh, about the 1990s, uh, with the scholarship of Vinrip Lur in, in uh, I believe is now in Heidelberg, um, you had, and Michael Williams too contributed mostly to this, where, the, where you, f you finally had scholars saying, okay, let's take these uh, heresiological reports and not believe them anymore, at least not implicitly. And let's try to reconstruct what actually these people thought. And the key here is to focus not on the heresiological reports. See, people, this is, this is something that I find very common among uh, early Christians who are interested in it. When, when, someone, when someone wants to learn like about the Carpocratians or about the Gnostics, they turn to Irenaeus, as if Irenaeus is some kind of like encyclopedia. Um, but actually, Irenaeus is known to have uh, considerable errors, and his treatment of the Carpoc Carpocratians is a great example of the fact that we can prove that he is making false statements. So our only known source, our only known fragment of a Carpocratian comes not from Carpocrates himself, but from his son and disciple Epiphanes. And about a 520 word fragment or set of excerpts is quoted by Clement of Alexandria in book three of the Stromboda. And it's this that I, you know, execute uh, on this text, I execute a thoroughgoing commentary. And when you read Epiphanes, it's actually not so much that he's influenced by Plato's Republic, but by Stoic authors that came after him, um, Zeno of Kittium mostly, who talked about a utopian situation in which it was actually God's will that we not own anything. So it's actually a, a socialist vision. And uh, Epiphanes is really concerned about justice and about uh, social justice, which is quite unique in the ancient world. Usually they focus mostly on individual justice. And so, yes, Epiphanes would would like to see a world in which there was uh, no aristocracy, where everyone owned uh, uh, everything equally. And in fact, where there was no ownership, but that we all sort of went back into to the natural state, what he thought, um, and that you know, of, of animals, basically, uh, who didn't claim to, you know, own pieces of, of earth and fight wars over it. And this is a, this is a vision, an uh, astounding vision, um, which is probably influenced by the author of Acts, where the author of Acts presents early Christianity as basically like a communist movement, where everybody is sharing and uh, those who pretend to share get killed by God. Uh, that's Ananias and Sapphira. But, uh, but that, that vision of like the primitive uh, utopia of the church, probably very little of that is true. But as a vision, that utopian vision had a profound impact on thinkers like Epiphanes, who is also reading these Platonic and Stoic utopias about why was God's will that we, you know, give up private ownership? And one of the most fascinating things uh, is that Epiphanes believes in, in a good creator. You know, so th that it's often said, you know, well, the Gnostics believe that the creator is evil. And that's like, you know, the key feature. Whereas you go back to Epiphanes, he has no truck with the creator. In fact, he uh, quotes um, the Timaeus, and refers to you know the creator as the god and father of this cosmos, which makes it very fascinating when you turn over to Irenaeus and Irenaeus says that they that they don't that they believe the creator is in league with the devil, and that the actual creators are angels. So here's a place where Irenaeus's report can actually be checked. And when you turn over to Epiphanes, he doesn't have any problem with the creator, nor does he have a doctrine of angelic creation. So, 
you know, who's right? Is it the uh, the only authentic corporate creation source, or is it the hostile reporter who wants to destroy corporate creation Christianity as he does every single Christian movement that is not his own? Okay, so part of the the emphasis of the book is to undercut, okay, this unfortunately, uh, oh, I, I don't know what to call it. Uh, I was going to say nostalgic, but this this unfortunate tendency, even among scholars today, to believe Irenaeus when, in fact, he contradicts a primary source. Irenaeus is always a secondary source. He's always a hostile source, and he therefore always can be trumped by uh, the primary source. But these, this is only, you know, the tip of the iceberg for, you know, actually uncovering what early carpet creations thought. And I really try to put a lot of emphasis on Marcelina because in some cases, it's clear that Marcelina was the most daring carpet creation of all and that she exceeded her teacher. So that Celsus, again, when he thinks of carp, carp, he carpocrations, right? He doesn't even know the term carpocrations. He knows them as harpocrations. And we don't know, we don't know why Celsus calls them harpocrations, uh, but we do know that Carpocrates and, Harpo and Harpocrates are sometimes viewed as, uh, you know, basically, I mean, they're the same character, Harpocrates being the child of Isis and Osiris, and who is also called Carpocrates, which means master of the harvest. But what Celsus focuses on, and he's probably a witness to, to early Alexandria, is, is Marcellinians. And he focuses on the female teachers who led the movement. And then when you turn over to Irenaeus, that's the fascinating thing that actually, he doesn't make this absolutely clear, but really the, the movement that came to Rome was Marcellinian that she was the one who to, had the courage to take ship and then go recruit in Rome and create a very successful uh, corporation movement in Rome. And it's that movement which threatened Irenaeus in which generated his hostile report. And the sick thing about it is that when you get to later heresiologists, later heresiologists in the West are so threatened by Marcellina's female leadership I mean, she's the only known female leader, you know, in Rome running her own movement, her own Christian movement. Um, I, I mean, it's it's absolutely unheard of. And that when you get to the refutator in Tertullian, the way that they attack Marcellina is they deliberately don't mention her. Mm -hmm. Because they are so threatened by the idea that there could be a woman running around leading a church in Peter's seat yeah. that she is erased from history. Well, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, a dozen more groups, but we, we are starting to get into wrap-up territory. So I, I guess for my final question, is is learning about these ancient Christianities only for those with, a, with an antiquarian interest, or, or do you see them as relevant to, to the modern day and to modern religion? Well, to quote the author of uh, Ecclesiastes or Kohelet, there's nothing new under the sun, and... One of the major metaphors for Christianity in the second century is the laboratory or laboratory metaphor where Christians are running experiments theologically and they are seeing what works and what does not work. And what's interesting is theologically, they are trying the options that in many ways still survive today. Uh, and so, it's, I, I often, um, you know, cringe when I hear that, you know, well, some Christian movements died and only one survived. Um, well, it's really not very historically accurate. And even when you're thinking in terms of modern sociology, I mean, you know, that's just not a very accurate way of, of portraying it. No, there were lots of Christian ideas in movements and those Christian ideas and movements theologically had an impact in terms of reception history that lasted far into late antiquity, far into the Middle Ages, and up until our own 
time. So that, for instance, this, this modalistic understanding of the Trinity, which is common in the second century, you know, it, it reappears in, in Mormon theology, um, you know, where the Father is the Son. Um, and uh, the emphasis on deification as a mode of salvation well, that also gets renewed in, in, in Mormonism as an idea that's a very ancient idea and that takes on a new shape in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, but there are a whole host of, of other ideas and rituals that Christians engaged in that had these after effects and that some of them were absorbed into the Catholic tradition, like the some of the anointing rituals. You know, for instance, the five seals ritual of the Sethians is partially an anointing ritual. And yeah, the use of ointment or myrrh in some Christian traditions, actually, that that actually survives. Um, uh, in, in some Christian groups, um, it was widespread and it's, you know, it happens before or after baptism. You know, your forehead gets a little bit of, of oil on it. And, or some kind of myrrh or perfume, and there you go. Uh, there are certain elements that just continue to last. Um, and even Marcionism, you know, Marcionism, which, which seemed to the heresiologists as, you know, the greatest of all threats, you know, the daring idea that the creator was evil. Um, I find that Marcionism shows up all the time in modern Christianity where Christians will will say to me, you know, I believe the God of the Old Testament is a bad dude. Um, and I, that's why I don't read the Old Testament or, or you know, I, <laughs> I I mean, I even had a pastor I, or, or whom I talked to in private and she, she said that she never preached from the Old Testament because she honestly believed that the deed in the Old Testament was evil. And she had no idea that this was basically Marcion's point. <laughs> but I mean, and she wouldn't have probably have admitted that, but that those ideas, uh, you know, how can we have a version of Christianity where you believe that the God of the Old Testament is evil? Well, the fact is those forms of Christianity survive. I mean, there are people, good Christians who actually think that and they are, don't cease to be Christians when they when they think those things. So, absolutely, all of this is really really relevant, um, and I would really encourage you know everyone to learn more about early Christian history, uh, what might be thought of as the dark side of early Christian history. But you know whether you agree with this material or not is is irrelevant. It is extremely influential and enlightening when you realize that you know some of these people confirm your own intuitions that you've always, you know, believed um, that in some sense, you know, you believe that eating from the tree of Gnosis is a good thing. And you've never been able to understand why the creator had such a problem and why he kicked Adam and Eve out, you know. <laughs> um, well, early Christians struggled with that idea and they differed on that idea. And we, as modern people, we don't have a right anymore to replicate the language of the heresiologists and say, well, if they thought this, then they weren't Christian. Yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> there are a thousand ways to be Christian. And one of the great lessons of history is that you can look back and at this age of experimentation and uh, realize that it is a great mirror for our own time of, of fantastic Christian pluralism. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for synchronicities, I, I think these shows will come out one after another, but I, I was interviewing Dr. Justin Sledge last night and he was talking about how, you know, Christianity is full of modern Marcionites. You can go to Mississippi and you'll find tons of Marcionites there without even knowing it. Um, and for modalism, it, it's quite fascinating. You know, the Mormons formally have it, but again, if you talk, I don't want to say most Christians, but if you talk to a lot of Christians and get them to explain the, the Trinity, you know, they're, they're going to give you a formulation that's pretty close to modal. So the very fascinating stuff, and I, I think you're 100% right, this mirror of history 
is uh, is is so incredibly relevant. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Litwan. It was it was awesome having you. Uh, again, we will plug your Patreon. That is patreon.com slash mdavidlitwa. Um, I'll do my plugs quickly, which of course is our Patreon. Give to our Patreon so I can afford to sign up for Dr. Litwa's Patreon. So that's <laughs> patreon.com slash Gnostic. Um, I also do uh, free secular meditation, uh, the stress relief, uh, mindfulness-based uh, uh, meditation online. 11 a.m. Montreal time Sunday mornings. Check that out at mileandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I'm a student researcher doing uh, a university degree at an alternative university, debt-free university called the Global Center for Advanced Studies. Check them out online at gcast.ie, particularly if you have an interest in theology. They have some very interesting theology courses, some very interesting thinkers, so hit that up. But, you know, it's an interesting philosophy, liberal arts, psychoanalysis. Uh, if you have an interest in any of those, uh, check out gcast.ie. Uh, again, Dr. Uh, Litwa, thanks so much. Uh, we hope that you'll come back, talk to us about Simon, talk to us about uh, all of your many other books. And uh, this is uh, Deacon John signing off. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>